Broadway's Mean Girls. Welcome. So this is what the crowd looks like when it is snowing outside. So I'm not sure um, <laughs> if we would have been able to fill the house as, or even more. So thank you so much, everybody who came out today. Um, I'm I'm Erin Helmrich. I'm one of the librarians here. I'm going to be doing a Q&A with our ladies tonight. But I am going to start by reading their credentials because they're pretty awesome. Oh. So this is what we had on our website. Um, so. Ann Arbor native Ashley Park, who plays Gretchen. Welcome home. Is joined by her fellow U of M alums, Taylor Louderman, who plays Regina. And then Erica Henningsen plays Caddy. Ashley Park received Tony Drama League, Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle, and Cheetah Rivera nominations for her role as Gretchen and Mean Girls. Her Broadway credits include the roles of Tup Tim and Lincoln Center's The King and I, Sunday in the Park with George, and Mamma Mia. Off-Broadway credits include the role of Mui in K-pop. Ashley will soon be featured in the upcoming Tales of the City on Netflix. And she is the recipient of the Actor Equity Association's 2018 Clarence Derwent Award. Then, Taylor Louderman received a Best Leading Actress Tony nomination for this performance, as well as Drama League and Outer Critics Circle nominations and Broadway.com's Audience Choice Award for Best Diva Performance. <laughs> <laughs> she was yeah. previously seen on Broadway in Kinky Boots following her Broadway debut in Bring It On. Her TV credits include the role of Wendy in NBC's Peter Pan Live, CBS's The Good Fight, HBO's High Maintenance, and Nick Jr.'s Sunny Day, so quite a range. Her off-Broadway credits include starring roles at the Vineyard, Paper Mill Playhouse, and The Muni. Lastly, not least, Erica Henningsen previously portrayed Fantine, and I'll have you say that properly, because I probably didn't, in the recent Broadway <laughs> revival of Both Les Miserables, <laughs> Kim Ravenel in PBS's Live from Lincoln Center Showboat, and Beth in Signature Theater's world premiere of Kathleen Marshall, Cheryl Crow's musical Diner. And she has been featured opposite Tyne Daly in York Theater Company staging of Jerry Herman's Dear World, and has played Nellie Forbush in South Pacific and Sophie in Mamma Mia at Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. She is the recipient of Alan Eisenberg Actors Equity Award. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I also just expect the three of you to jump in whenever it seems appropriate. I know you have no problem um, getting on the topics and sharing them with each other. But my first question, aside from the fact that U of M is awesome, how is it that the three of you all ended up on Broadway in the same show? Can you talk about that <laughs> process? And were you friends when you were at U of M attending? <laughs> Such a fun story. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, which part? How well, we all ended up together? Uh, me and Taylor were in the same class. These yes. are my two best friends separately in school because Taylor left after sophomore year for Bring It On. We were in the same class and then me and Erica became really close. I was a year younger than friend. Ashley. We were close friends via school, our extracurriculars, everything. And it is <laughs> crazy that we are all cast in this together because our team didn't even find out until like maybe two weeks into the rehearsal process yeah. that we had all not only been in school together but we're friends from school. And it is, it's, I think it's a testament to, I mean, we had no chemistry reads or anything. They just like. They were like, those like, three girls, those three they girls. seem nice. Let's yeah. get them in. Yeah. <laughs> Let's choose them. They work well. Yes. They work well. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's, it's truly just luck that also a show exists right now that has five young female leads, because when was the last time that happened? Um, because it gave a place for three of those girls to be us, and we're in the right age range and the right type. and the material was a fit, so that's truly just luck that Mean Girls exists to be a musical at this time yeah. for us. But U of M is, I think, just a really special place that, um, it, I don't know, I, I think, I wonder if people know that it's one of the top programs in the country for musical theater. <laughs> in one of the top cities in the country. I know, I know. It's, it, what was really cool about going to school here was that, um, yes, we were at the top in the top program for musical theater, but everyone is in the top program for what they do, essentially. Sure. You know, whereas other schools, I think um, it's not necessarily like that. So it was really cool to. It was so much um, humbling that we weren't 
you know, like, we were surrounded by... Um, it's amazing people. Amazing people. It, I mean, we really thought for a lot of the rehearsal process, especially for DC, we were like, is somebody punking us? Like, is this real right now that they're letting us play? Like, and sometimes we're, like, we're on stage together, we'll be putzing around and be like, oh my god, we're on Broadway together right now. <laughs> I can't believe they're letting us do this. What was the day? I, like, kind of spaced out at one moment. Nobody's watching me on stage at this moment, but Ashley just goes over. She goes, Erica, you're on Broadway right now. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> we're in a scene when we're talking, because we have a couple moments where there's, you know, the focus is somewhere else, and so we can have a separate conversation. Totally. Yeah. And I think that sometimes we'll carry on our real, like, talking about dinner, like, well, we got at the mall that day, or something yeah. like that. And the, the mall. mall. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you went to a mall in New York City? But then we'll have to be like, Erica, we're on Broadway right now. Oh, and we, we just spoke at uh, for our department um, just what, an hour ago, and it was just so moving for us because um, we were those kids sitting in the chairs um, like five years ago. I don't want to. Say how old are <laughs> you? Um, and, and, so, and, and looking up to the alumni at that point, and so to be back there was really a cool moment. We still feel like we're like the students. So. Yeah. 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 But in terms of the show, I mean, they were the first two people. I remember very vividly um, when Erica FaceTimed me. I was doing a show in Dallas. FaceTimed me to tell me that she had gotten the role of Katie. And like I screenshotted it. We were, I was so excited for them because and I knew about Taylor being Regina very early on. So right. like, I was just so psyched to go to like opening night as like their friend. And so, and I- She went as our co-star. <laughs> my audition process, I had, it was all within like seven hours and I flew in from yeah. Dallas. It was very, very crazy. But the mm -hmm. first, I remember getting on my plane back to Dallas after auditioning that morning and getting the call that afternoon. And I like, Taylor had no, I didn't want to like put pressure on her, but she had known that because I asked her a couple questions about the audition sites and stuff, and I called her right before I got on the plane, and then she was like, hi, and I said, Taylor, you can't sit with us, and she just like, screamed. Jumping up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we are, uh, yeah. Well, it sort of answers a little bit. I had somebody who wanted me to ask who you had to maim or kill to get your role. <laughs> it was a little more organic then. Yes. Um, Nobody's dead. So just out of curiosity, um, as far as getting ready for the roles, do either, did any of you have to draw on either <laughs> real life experiences on one side of the mean girl experience or not? Or, and how do you feel about the character you play as far as relating to them or not? I think as an actor, we're always trying to take anything from our lives and be able to use that in our storytelling. So yes, um, <laughs> we can definitely access experiences that maybe we had with mean girls or, um, or being the mean girl sometimes. I think everybody has made mistakes. Um, and so that was, uh, I, I think, kind of cool to take a high school experiences and almost as therapy, um, dive into them again and, and use them in, in our art as a cautionary tale, hopefully for, for yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, they get it, they get it. They've seen the show. Yeah. I mean, I think when you're doing a show eight times a week and for as long as, you know, for long runs like this, mm -hmm. um, we have to find some kind of uh, honesty in like the character that we're portraying. And we had a great creatives that really um, developed it with us to make it feel as honest it, as it could on us. Because also the thing about comedy is, it's not funny when you can tell that somebody's acting. You know, it's not, it's, you you laugh with them when they give you permission, but also when you're you're in on the joke. So mm -hmm. I think it was something that we, like, had, we took time crafting, but. Um, yeah. A, a big thing, and I see like a lot of teens out here, um, and you know, the show's for, it shows for everybody, but the show is really for you. Um, you know, Tina brought in some of her eldest daughter's friends to watch one of our run-throughs to be like, does this feel accurate? Um, and I loved when she did that because a big thing that I had problems with is I, I play Katie, and there were behavior, there's things she does where I'm like, that, why would she do that? That seems like just asking for a disaster. And Tina was like, do you remember what it's like to be 16 years old? <laughs> so and I was like, right. That was a big thing that, you know, I don't know if you guys had to deal with this when you were creating the roles, but it was something I had to deal with a lot of time to not judge the character because I, 10 years older than a 16-year-old girl, there were times where I was like, well, she would never do that. But I was thinking of it with my mind and realizing like, oh, she is a young woman who is figuring out who she is and doing so via trial and error, like we all do. 
Um, and so that was a big part for me to go back and revisit my 16-year-old self and to not to remember, like, you know, you kind of have to F up a couple times to <laughs> land where you, where you should. Yeah, right, time. And I think this, I mean, for me, the song, What's Wrong With Me, it was the first piece of music that I had heard from the show. It was for my audition. And right away, I was like, oh, I understand this girl. I mean, you know, and I've never had, um, I've never performed a song on a stage where I truly feel that by the end of it, like every single person in the audience has connected in some way or relates to it because every single person has felt like, what am I doing wrong? Why can't I? Why am I not liked? What, what, what's wrong with me? And so I think that that is a very easy thing to tap into. It's not always fun to be like neurotic and in your head um, to play that eight times a week, but it's definitely like its own kind of what you're saying, its own kind of therapy. <laughs> yeah. And going back to the movie in general, were you fans of the movie? Were you familiar with all Duh. of your characters? Duh. Yeah. Duh. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we definitely, we had all seen it. It's like part of the culture growing up, so. You know when we first like, <laughs> what? when we first. What's so funny about that? <laughs> um, uh, so it, we, we did feel that pressure to, you know, live up to the expectations of how well the film did, but that was on us. Um, not the creative team at all. They really gave us the freedom to express these characters with our own experiences and our own essence, which was, I think, what let the piece rise to, to what it yeah. became, you know. If you try to imitate something, it's not going to be honest and genuine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, were there characters that you wanted, but you did you not get, did you get your, your chosen character choice? Like, if you had to pick who you were going to play in the movie. I, think we were, I was only asked to do this one. Okay. I, like, I, all the other parts I went in for Damien, but it didn't pan out. Yeah. It's very funny. Like we've talked about this, where we would love to do a concert one night where we all, all switch song. off yeah. songs because everybody, everybody on that stage is incredibly talented. Everybody can sing anything that is on that stage, but the essence of everybody is so clearly who they play. Like, and it's funny. Ash is a very confident person but she's also a very sociable person and you know you think of Gretchen and you think like oh she's scared she's vulnerable but there's something there's like a heart to Ashley that is like that's her essence that comes into Gretchen. Taylor you say this all the time that you're not as confident as Regina is but you're able to tap into this thing that clearly exists inside you to play her. Yeah. So like the essence even if it's not what we wear on our sleeve like there was only one character we each could play in this show. Yeah. Like, it was just so obvious. Mm -hmm. And Tina was really good at writing around our strengths. I think that's yeah. what makes her a really awesome writer. She can, she can uh, really understand us wholly and, and know what we can do best and write for it, yeah. which is cool. Well, speaking of Tina, <laughs> what kind of access have you had to her? And has it been, I mean, how nervous were you and what was that? You know, the whole experience like so nervous <laughs> I remember going into my audition I had to wear really high heels and a, a skirt and my legs were like so veiny and red and shaky <laughs> as I walked in. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here I'm so confident you know um, but she's so involved and so passionate about it and what was so cool is that she really felt like when she made the movie she did not know it was going to be that successful and uh when she came back to do the musical, she thought it was important to elevate the message so that it was telling more of a positive message because she didn't realize what an impact it would have on our age, yeah. our generation. Yeah. You know? yeah. That was really cool. She was, I mean, it's so funny to think about that now when we were like so nervous. And she's, she really, she said she's going to make a Broadway musical and she really made it her baby. You know, she oh, was yeah. there. There was, you know, people ask all the time, was she, did she ever come around? She was in rehearsal every day. Every day! There was not a rehearsal day that she, she missed. missed. She had her own dressing room in D.C. with us because she was just around all the time. And, like, even she, like, we had a holiday party at our house, yeah. you know, and she, because um, her husband, Jeff Bridgman, wrote the music. Mm -hmm. um, it was, like, really a family affair. We called them mom and dad. Their daughters are around. <laughs> they came to, you know, they, they come, to, they were just around for everything. And their office is, like, four blocks from our theater. So sometimes we'll, like, be going down an intermission and be like, oh, hey, Tina. She's like, hey. And, and so. very accessible. Very, uh, yeah. She's always messaging us on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sassy comments, yeah. I think. And, 
Yeah, I, I think it's funny to even just hear the question, what kind of access did you have? Because Tina is the type of person who she doesn't exist. If she's working on a project, she doesn't exist in a world where she's going to shut herself in a way in a writing room and leave you to figure it out with the pages you get the next morning, um, which was, I don't know if that's what I expected, but it was certainly amazing to realize like that collaborator and that name was just as much on the front lines with us um, as our director and as our choreographer. And egoless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned it sounds like there was a decent amount of rewriting. Was, was that all done before, or obviously maybe when you were in DC as she was getting to know you with oh, some of the tweaks? Oh, the tryout was in DC. It was definitely. Did anybody see it? In DC. Here in DC. Nice. Hi. Hi. It's very, you know different and then we, throughout the preview process of, on Broadway we changed a lot. I mean I think all three of us had huge, like your entire Halloween song was a yeah. different song. Your, you went like 18 different openings and closings and, you know. <laughs> when we did it, not have a closing number for the show and we moved into the theater. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember like, the day before we moved into the theater, I don't know if you guys know that like the song Fearless all throughout DC and everything had been the song called Justice. It was the same two, just different words. And I remember getting the lyrics the day before we were going to tech and being like, fearless, like, <laughs> what is this? Why are they changing it now? Yeah, so, um, but they really did write for, uh, they, they, I love what you said, um, you say this a lot, the best idea always won. Yeah. In terms of, and not that a, an idea lost in any way, but like, we all were just so game to try and fail and commit. Um, in order to find the best possible mm -hmm. storytelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was all about the show. Okay. It was never about one person's agenda, which was really, really cool to be a part of. Uh, I remember my gift from Tina and our opening in DC was a jar of all the different punchlines we tried for one joke that ultimately got cut because <laughs> the joke was my fat suit. And so she was trying to write a joke on top of that. And, and so we ended up not using any of them, but it was so cool to have this we jar. We her for line readings, though. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, this is a, how this would you say this? I, Tina, like, <laughs> how would you how say would it? You say? <laughs> <laughs> She was there sort she of wouldn't. a drop dead, like we're going to stop rewriting, or did it kind of just get to a natural point? A show has to free. So the okay. show is um, on opening night, at, you know, by on paper, opening night of a show is when the show is now frozen. But our director was lovely in that, especially before like most of the critics came. He froze the show, I think, a week before a opening week, night, yeah. just so that we could settle into it and feel like it was our show. But possible. you do kind of know when a moment is settled. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm curious, I'm going to start with Taylor. Um, if you could each talk about some of your past experiences on Broadway and like what made this one differently, um, different mm -hmm. or made it easier or less, you know, scary. I'm oh. curious too, because especially since you stepped away from school to do Bring It On, what that yeah. experience was like. Yeah. Um, probably for a lot of reasons, my experience with uh, Bring It On being that it was my, my first one. I was so young. Uh, it was the director's first time directing the show. It was a lot of Broadway debuts. I really didn't feel ownership over what I was creating. And by that, I mean they were so specific with me about what they wanted um, to like down to don't raise your hand higher than this point, you know. Um, and with Mean Girls, um, I'm working with a team that has a lot of experience and confidence. And I had more experience by that point. And this character felt, um, I don't want to say easy, but with it in me and they trusted me uh, to where I felt like I could really bring a lot to the table. So it felt like a true collaboration. And that was so rewarding. Um, so that's what I, I would say about that. And we were also talking about replacing a little bit too. Um, in, in Kinky Boots I replaced. Uh, we've, all, we've all done that where you don't get the creative process. You're really stepping into a machine that's already been running for a few years give or take, and you're rehearsing by yourself with the stage manager or the associate director, and it's scary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, cons and I think I find the creative process most rewarding. Um, and then uh, Peter Pan Live was really cool in that we were able to bring musicals to people uh, miles and miles away that may not be able to access or even know what musical theater is 
uh, outside of New York City. So that was cool, but also terrifying because it's one night. Um, whereas, you know, on Broadway, you're doing it eight times a week. So if I mess up this thing tonight, who cares? Because tomorrow I'm going to do it again. <laughs> you Maybe twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some empathy for the rent folks that didn't go off very well yeah. on Sunday night for oh, Fox. We haven't seen. watched. We like, like, the plane yeah, they apparently, show. the um, one of the main people had hurt his foot, so yeah. they ended up airing um, a Kate. dress Rehearsal. Yeah. At least they had a dress rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Well, when what we did, um, when we did, well, except for the last. Sorry. Except for the last. Yeah, yeah that's research. right. When we did Peter Pan Live, they were rolling the dress rehearsal at the same time in case anything went, went wrong. Yeah. You know, so it does take away from the yeah. live experience, yeah. but it was still special. And what about you, Ashley, with all of your different experience on Broadway? You know, how did this one feel? Um, oh, it's just vastly different. We are we had um, you know, we are talking to our department and stuff like that. We are talking about the different courses that we take freshmen and stuff. I was actually thinking that my re resume feels like it's um, a a cur curriculum a little bit. Yeah. Like doing a, a, starting with Rogers and Hammerstein. Actually starting with Mama Mia. Let's not forget Mama Mia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I'm so glad that my first experience on Broadway when I played Tufts and a lot of people asked me, do you wish that this was your debut? Do you wish that you were just like, you had a starring role right away? And I, and I oh, was really a actually, weird question. you know, or like, do, do you yeah. wish that this, you know, because there was a lot of, you know, uh, like theater world awards. Totally, like that, totally. Where, like, do you wish that this was your big break? Mm. Right. And I was like, well, I don't think of, you know, I don't really think of anything in our career as like a big break. Like, we're just working. And I think that um, I loved being put into Mama Mia because this is a show that I was running for 11 years. I met people that like, have really made like, a livelihood and a, like a, a life just doing this show, like that show eight times a week, taking a month off, whatever, coming back. And I learned the ropes of a Broadway theater. I learned like what you do and don't say backstage and what you can, how you should ask for certain things from stage managers and just everything I didn't know from school. It was like a really learning process. So I think that was really informative. But in terms of this, a lot, this is the first time Mean Girls I originated a role, I guess. Um, but in many ways, it felt like a revival because Gretchen Wieners is so iconic in our pop culture and everything that I really had to, we had to really put all of those voices aside and figure out what my Gretchen was going to be. And for me, I mean, to be honest, after The King and I, um, I did it for a year and a half, like about 600 performances. And it was, a lot of people in New York thought, oh, she's drama, she just only does drama. And so I lost a lot of confidence in being able to, I think I'm a naturally, I live in a world of, I think my life is like a sitcom. I'm constantly <laughs> like there. So I really wanted to explore comedy. And so this kind of, the fact that we got to go into a room, even to audition for Tina Fey, yeah. Macy Nicolau, who is the, um, you know, really the, the king of musical comedy right now, was just like a really big blessing. And then to be entrusted with this kind of character was really, really, fun and I get to like dance and make people laugh and that's something that I haven't gotten to do a lot yeah. um, on a Broadway stage. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Erica? Um, yeah, I, uh, my debut was Les Mis. I replaced the incredible Casey Levy as Fontaine and, right? <laughs> and that was really like, I, I, it's so funny, I did not realize what an opportunity I was being given. Um, to join the lineage of women who have played Fontaine. Like, it's just some of the greats. And I just happen to be a little blip on that list right now. And so the biggest thing for me and the biggest difference between when you replace and when you get to originate is I, Les Mis was already running. And not just running in New York, like it's been running since the 80s. We all know, or at least I did, like Les Mis is a machine, you just know it. And so I got two weeks of rehearsal and they just slotted me into Fontaine. And for a very long time, I just wanted to be of service to the show. I didn't want to try anything too crazy creatively because I just thought people have an idea of what they think Fontaine should be because they've all seen it, they all know it. So I felt very burdened by the idea of like, I have to be what people want Fontaine to be. The great thing about Mean Girls is you would think that would be the case for this because it's such a brand recognition product. We all know what Lindsay Lohan did in the movie. But because A, it's a musical, it's just totally different. 
and because our creative team never put that pressure on us, we were saying we didn't even watch the movie at a certain point because it just became this whole other thing. And the character of my character, Katie, became a totally different thing. So it was never, I didn't feel that similar pressure that I felt with Fontaine of like, I have to give these people the Fontaine they came to see. <laughs> because I get the, the privilege of being like, I get to be your first musical Katie. Like, how awesome is that opportunity? Um, and I was happy to take it and run with it and get to craft with my team and my cast the version of what she is. Well, and a new thing for all of us, I think we're all so happy that we didn't come into this project um, green, as they say, you know, with, without having experience with the industry and people in the industry because of how high profile and how, how, how high pressure it was in terms of especially, I think it was our first like real award season um, that all of us had to go through and really like um, to do a show eight times a week and to be at attention for all of those things during the day was really a massive um, undertaking. And I think that we are all really glad that we weren't, we had all done eight shows a week and like knew what that part of it was so that we were safe there totally. in order to be present for the other things that were asked of us for this process. Yeah. So I'm curious, I had heard, and hopefully this was just somebody behind the scenes being mean, that <laughs> there were, um, the night that Lindsay Lohan came to visit, that supposedly some of the mean girls were being mean about Lindsay. Oh no, she <laughs> and I. Yeah, that, but she never came. She, she hasn't come. Came. Interesting. So she no, was supposed to, and I think it leaked, and they just, you know, she was it's like, "I'll come another time." We went on to an event that she invited us to, and she was incredibly lovely to us, and she, and we thought she was super cool, and you know, tabloids would be tabloids. Yeah. Um, it's interesting with all of the positive. With all the attention also comes people who would like to bring you down and um, see us not get along or not be supportive of each other, uh, which is too bad. But also I think we're so fortunate that we have uh, Tina and Nell and, um, and, and Casey, just these, these leaders that um, demonstrated, uh, what's the four agreements that Tina no, talks about? No, what are they called? The our first day, minutes. Tina Fey says to us all, we have to be in this together. You need to trust us. Our end goal is to put on this show, this big magical show, and um, that's what we're trying to do here. And we're going to all be kind to each other, and no matter what anyone else says out there. And, you know, because it was a, we knew that Mean Girls was going to be something that was, um, that a lot of people were excited about, but also was going to be under a lot of scrutiny from all different eyes, and we just had to keep doing the show that we were doing and the message that we were sending. What are the four agreements? Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions. Uh, speak impeccably, or yeah. be impeccable with your speech, which means don't gossip, be don't mindful. say mean things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it makes for, uh, what it did was it made for a much better environment where we felt free to be creative, where we felt free to fail, um, and thus a much better product, uh, which I so appreciated yeah. having experiences where that wasn't the main you know, priority for the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And um, that can seep into any industry and be so valuable. Right, yeah. so that, I mean, that tablet was especially yes. purple. No. Really <laughs> <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, have you met any of your other character counterpoints from the movie, like Lacey Chabert or Rachel McAdams? Have they come to the show? Or I talked to her. Oh, she like a Lacey. Like oh. she really wants to. She has a family, and she's been filming a lot of. She lives and lives in New York. Right. I think she's gonna try to visit before. You know. Yeah, that's cool. At some point. Yeah. Almost everybody Lindsay. has come except the three plastics and Lindsay. Okay. Which. To that's totally okay. You know, we hope they come and yeah. if they I don't, I don't want to know when they're yeah, there. Yeah, we don't Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll be on stage just thinking, what are they thinking yeah. right now yeah. instead yeah. of being yeah. able to do the, the show? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm curious. Um, as far as, is there, an, when with a show like this, is there even an end time for your, like your part in it? Do you, <sighs> is that a contract or how does that work as far as how much yeah, we're, longer we're, you'll be in the show? Uh, on Broadway, it can vary, right? Contract to contract, it's so, so different. Um, we are all sort of in that process right now, figuring out what the next step is. Um, we don't really know yet. <laughs> it's so scary to think of leaving this show that we've poured our heart and soul into, uh, but doing the same thing eight times a week. Um, 
you know, once the once you open the show, the creatives leave. The director leaves and you're just there doing the same thing every night. And um, uh, for me, it's been tough to find the joy in that sometimes. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, a, it's a tough decision to make. Well, also, it, you know, when you're in a show eight times a week, it's, it's very difficult, if possible, to do other work. You know, all of us have done what we call double duty, working on other projects as we're doing a show at night. But right. it, our bodies aren't made for that. You know, we get one day off a week. Like, today's our day off. And we, they, if we had show, you know, shows on Sunday nights, we have show tomorrow. So, like, the sustainability of that, if we want to explore other creative processes, um, it's, it's tricky because it feels counterintuitive because, you know, graduating from school and, like, paying tuition for a degree and then, like, our goal is to find a job that is solid. This is a show that's not closing anytime soon and, you know, want us to stay. And right. that is the, on paper, the, the dream. biggest blessing. That's the dream. Yeah. So it really comes down to um, what, you know, we personally find happiness in doing. Stuff. So we're not quite sure, the, but the show's yeah. running. The <laughs> industry is interesting um, mm -hmm. in that it might look like we have a lot of power, but the power is uh, um, concentrated in the producer and um, theater owning that side of things. So we don't have a lot of control over many of the things you might think. Yeah. yeah. Were all three of you on the original broadcast or the, the recording though for the show? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that's really and special. And if you don't have a chance to go see it, um, Lincoln Center Library does these things called archival footing tapings. Um, and then it's very old school, but you can go to the library and you can check it out and you can see the production with the original cast members. So you have to be there though. You have to be there, yeah. You can't like download it to your computer. Um, so that's the thing, I was like, you know, however it all pans out for all of us in this next year or so, if you want to see the original cast at some point, there will be a taping, a very good taping in the Lincoln Center Library. Can you talk about the recording of the, the cast recording? The like cast recording. Like, yeah, yeah um, it's so funny. Uh, we have, uh, the Share Show just opened across from us and they're doing their cast recording right now and they did it just as we did. We did a show on Sunday evening a Sunday afternoon, we had had an eight show week, and then a couple of us walked to the recording studio and started recording our cast album. That's gonna be permanent forever. Forever. And you're like, wait, I just did eight shows, you wanna record this voice forever? Um, so, and you, you do it in, we did it in two and a half days. Um, that night session was kind of like some smaller things, like uh, things that did not have large orchestral moments that like the quieter ballad moments like my no, scene with Aaron your song was wrong with me um, and then the next day we all showed up with the whole cast to record everything and I, I, it's very it's very exciting because you're just realizing you know I think that's such a milestone moment if you're somebody like me who grew up listening to cast album recordings the first time I was home in Virginia visiting my parents, it came on on like Broadway Sirius XM with my mom and I was like, oh my God, like this is the thing. Like we listened to In the Heights on repeat for two years and like yeah. now you get to hear me in the car and I'm here with you and like that's, you know, that's something that we don't listen to the cast album well, you actually recently did. We don't listen to the cast album yeah, anymore yeah. because, you know, we're doing it eight times a week. I would die if I heard myself yeah. again. <laughs> but, um, but that's the thing. I was like, that is such a special thing that I sometimes forget and I sometimes take for granted that there's a cast album that teens and adults are listening to and I'm on it. What's yeah. so crazy though is I, I always, I'll never understand this tradition is that they, not only do they do it like in the day off, but very often they do it very, very soon after opening night. Yeah. And for me, like, I, like it's the same thing with the King and I recording. I'm like, gosh, like this show even now, I oh like, I sing it so differently than I did when we opened. But you know, we've lived in these characters, yeah. and the, the songs feel like we could sing it at any point. If we recorded um, our cast album now, it would sound entirely different. Entirely different. I truly, I like 100% stand by that statement. That's why I love the Sunday in the Park with George recording we did after the entire run. That's oh, good. that's cool. Nice run so that everybody was well rested and. We had we did exactly what we actually did in like the best the best version of our show. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 
So I'm curious, just switching to when you were here at, in Ann Arbor, can you each talk about um, your experience attending the university and give fan service and talk about how amazing Ann Arbor is? Yeah. And what you we miss? love Ann Arbor. We, we were just uh, like driving in here. You know, there's a snowstorm, but we were like, this is exactly what we wanted. <laughs> um, and just brought to tears because we have so many memories here. I mean, I was only here for two years, and I, I still, it just pulls at my heartstrings being back and um, talking to the department, you know. It's just such a special place, and I think... Um, what I love most about being, but about attending this place was um, the the safe space it was for me to learn and grow, be vulnerable, fail, um, and all while being in a supportive, surrounded by, you know, a, a supportive network and um, professors. That was so invaluable and. Uh, you don't get that in New York anymore. I, we were just talking, you know, it's so competitive. Yeah. Um. The community of Ann Arbor, I feel like, really embraces the university. Can and you hear me? Hello. <laughs> um, and that, that's just special, you know, that um, Ashley and I did something here that worked with the schools in Detroit, in Detroit, with the public schools. And we needed the help of Jimmy John's. We needed the help of Cottage Inn to feed the hundreds of young elementary school students that were coming in. And I just think like that doesn't happen in a larger city and it only happens in a place like Ann Arbor where the community of education and the community of the people who live here is so interwoven and everybody is in this symbiotic relationship where they want to uh, create things and help one another do the things that we want to do. <laughs> it's just awesome. Yeah. It's also, sorry, it's also a, an environment that is, uh, that values growth and learning, which is so cool. And it doesn't, uh, I think on Broadway we, we jump to, um, this is the product and here it is and let's judge it. Uh, and, um, and here I got this sense of like, no, it's a process always. Um, and, and you're always learning and that's what life is, which is really special. And it, I mean, Ann Arbor to me, because I grew up here, like, I have my family and, like, neighbors and friends, you know, everybody, you know. Neighbors? Here's, actually, Erica and Taylor asked me, like, oh, when we were getting nostalgic on the drive here from North Campus. Also, we haven't, we're so tired, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, they asked me, like, is Ann Arbor more of your, like, hometown and your university? Like, what does it feel like? And it, it really is both. It feels, yeah. you know, like, I grew up on these downtown, you know, downtown Ann Arbor as, like, my downtown. And then now it's like my campus, so it's just, and it's always really special, yeah. Is there anything, um, now that you've been gone for a while, I'm sure you notice changes too with coming back here. Does it okay, feel too different or too campus. changed <gasps> since you were here? I think we have, to, we have to do a drive in the daytime, I feel like, to really take it in. Without a snowstorm. Yeah. yeah. We were just trying to navigate. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, there's Angelo's, okay, we're close. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, I was like, truly like the stalwart things that we loved are still here and that's all that matters. Does Sava still exist? Is she yes. still? Yes. My girl! <laughs> My girl! I worked at Salvas for three years. Oh, okay. <laughs> three, really? I was a host, and then I got uh, promoted to head server. Whoa. Yeah. Wait, when? Senior <laughs> <laughs> year, baby, you were gone. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't get me any meals. <laughs> um, I'm curious, has anybody attempted to have bring in some audience participation, sort of Rocky Horror, by yelling out, you know, she doesn't even go here, or stop making fetch happen, or anything, <laughs> thankfully. They, you know what's funny is our show, what I love about it is, there, she, uh, Tina has kept some nuggets of stuff that people really like, but sure. it, that people are not sure when it's gonna come. Yeah. So there's definitely days when like the audience gets really excited when they hear, she doesn't even go here, like you can't sit with us, or any of that stuff, yeah. but um, it's not something that they can say along with it. You know, we, we learned, and Tina, will dissect, you know, a joke, an element of a joke has to be, it has to surprise you. Mm -hmm. um, and so with Mean Girls, we all quote it so much. If she just put that on stage, and no what we lab. learned in the yeah. lab, I remember um, we had the joke that Karen says, if you're from Africa, why are you white? And <laughs> the audience laughed at the first part. If you're from Africa, ha -ha, why are you white? So they were ahead of us. Um, and that's not the, that's not the, 
the nitty gritty of, of the storytelling we wanted. And so Tina was really smart to sort of keep some of those setups and then change the back end of it. So you're right. still getting something new. Most of the punchlines are new. Mm -hmm. Some the some of the setups remain the same, yeah. but most of the punchlines are brand new. But I will say, once the CD came out, we did see a vast oh, yeah. difference in you know before any anybody Calculus knew any yeah anybody <laughs> knew any of the lyrics or anything. People were so surprised by it and like would laugh it so much. And it's not that they're not enjoying it, but a lot of people who come watch the show now already know the jokes that are going to happen, um, which is you know. Fun, but also scary because you're like, well, if I forget my life, <laughs> they're gonna know. They know it. <laughs> yeah, it's different. That was like a very drastic shift mm -hmm. when like the CD when came the cast album yeah. came out for sure. It's actually smart. I mean, it makes total sense. You wouldn't want your entire audience to be laughing before you get to what right. They we lost so many to. good jokes though. They're like, we 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 go on like we have a group. A cast um, thread, text thread, text thread, and sometimes we'll just go on binges of like lines that were cut that we still find so funny. <laughs> we <laughs> found them funny. The <laughs> audience did not <laughs> find them funny. The audience did it. Our, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it like, oh, R.I.P. that. R.I.P. that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I'm curious. Were you a fan of Bring It On before you were were in it? Were you a fan of the movie and? I was. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Have you seen all of the Bring It On sequels? I. I did some trivia recently, and a couple friends were shocked that I think there's like six of them. No way. Um, I think I stopped at like three or four. <laughs> our, our story was the, it followed more of like the third one, I think, so. Okay. Uh, Kristen Dunst, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, Hayden. Oh. And it's here. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, I, I'm talking about a few things that you're working on in the future, Ashley. I know you're working on... Um, the reboot of Tales of the City um, for Netflix, and is so that takes place in San Francisco, obviously. But are they have they updated it? Is it going to be current day? Um, we we've, we've already wrapped. You so have we, okay. I was filming from July through November of last year, um, and we filmed most of it in New York. They did have it was very crazy because. Um, they did most of it chronologically, but some parts of it you just had to shoot in San Francisco. So they saved all of that for about two weeks in November. Um, and my my opening scenes were all taking place on the rooftop of, in San Francisco, but because I couldn't leave to go do the show, they built another set here with, that was just all green screen. Well, actually, wow. it was actually, <laughs> um, like, I didn't even know but this. But what was so crazy is like my last week of shooting, I was shooting in 10 episodes, I was shooting scenes from my very first episode right after shooting scenes from my very last episode. So it felt very counter crazy. Mm -hmm. But um, but they filmed most of it in um, these stu big studios in the Bronx. They built an entire set there and everything. Yeah. Is it just um, one of the books? Do they plan on continuing, or um, I can are you say, not allowed? I don't know, but no, it, it, what it is is it's if you any, if any of you know Tales of the City, um, based on the novels by Armistead and Alpin, um, that was Laura Libby's like huge thing. I think like twenty years ago, Olivia Dukakis, they had like four of the original um, cast members come back, and they're playing the same characters that they played. Just the story takes place now twenty some years later. Um, so she comes back to Barbary Lane and. All of that, so it was it was really fun to. I mean, I think one of the m most moving parts for me was like the first table read because I like didn't know what I was getting myself into, you know. Um, and I know that TV sometimes is very much like not a family or community, and so it f I felt very lucky that it was immediately felt like a very tight knit group because you have someone like Laura Linney who like cares so much about this project, and you can tell how moved she was that she's speaking. The, being um, this character again 20 years later. Like, it was it was really interesting to see. Do the characters that are coming back, they're actually a little bit more integrated? They're not just, like, cameos? They oh, have. there's all, like, mine is all, an all-new character. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, now there's new residents who live in the Barbary Lane, and so that's what a lot of the, half of the characters are new. Yeah. And what about the two of you? Do you have any projects that you're looking forward to in the future or that you can talk about? Mm. Well, I will say like a big thing for me this this year just the role that I do in the show it was I had to, like certain things were just not going to come across the table because I just don't have the energy to do them if I'm going to do the show eight times a week um, but now that we're rounding the year mark and I plan to still be there after that year mark um, I, I was thinking about it today on the plane I was like yeah that's I think now 
it's in my bones enough. I feel settled enough in the character. Like, I can do it even if I've got a low tank of gas. Um, I think I will open the doors a little bit more to new stuff coming in to work on during the day. Uh, and so we'll see, yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah. I've been really investing time in uh, teaching and producing. And um, I, I want to focus some of my efforts on bringing stronger storytelling to uh, maybe rural America or uh, area, my hometown, yeah, areas that could that could use it. You know, New York has such great theater already, and I'd love to spread the wealth a little bit. So um, we'll see what I can do there. Yeah. It, you know. And so all three of you live in New York full time. Do you still live very close to each other? As I read, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Well, when you're on a sh when you're in a show, you are doing it eight times a week, uh, and you only get one day off. So we were like, we want to be close to that theater, you know, because yeah. you don't want to get to go home between shows. And yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, I'd I'd love to change that about Broadway, where you get two days off, like most people. <laughs> uh, cause just because I want to go home and see my family more, you know, they're two hours on a plane, which is not, I, it's not you can't do that all the time. Yeah. So. Oh. So what are the differences in the shows that you're doing, daytime versus matinee, do you get like completely, can you can you characterize a daytime audience versus nighttime? Uh, or? Well, <laughs> we noticed a big change when the summer was over because we lost a lot of the school groups that were coming. Um, for, for better or for worse, sometimes our audiences were quieter, but we didn't have to deal with the random yelling that would just occur <laughs> in our show. And no, we don't mind it, we love it. Like we love that people are enthusiastic, but we kind of that hazardous thing went away when most of our audiences were like people in New York or New Jersey or the tri-state area. Um, so that was a big shift that happened. And I will say, I guess we notice a little difference from night to night and how it changes. I, I, I don't know if you were referring to this in your question, but the way that we do the show every night changes depending on where we are in the week. It's probably, in, it is imperceptible to the audience, I believe. It was perceptible to my father, who's seen the show 10 times. But you can, when it's your Friday night show, and you have two on Saturday and two on Sunday, the way that you can serve your energy on a Friday night is a little different than how you're going to do the show on Tuesday night after your day off. Yeah. Um, and it's so slight. It's the difference between like running to your spot on stage or just like walking with purpose. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think what we did learn is intention. As long as the intention is still there 100%, yes. you're still giving the same show. Yes. And you just, especially our bodies. I mean, we're, da I mean, we're dancing in stilettos um, and our ensemble is yeah. running on and off stage, rolling the set pieces, you know? So you have to also just, it's not even, conserve energy in a way of focusing the energy and being like, okay, I know I have to move this this many times this weekend. So like. Let's not blow out all my yeah. energy there. But, I cannot yeah. give 100% every night, I've learned. Or I cannot get through all eight shows. And I think it's a skill you develop that you mm -hmm. can't totally. learn in school. You can't learn school. Uh, how, to, how to measure you know, that recipe, yeah. Well, but we do see, I mean, I've never been in a show, I think, I, mean, I, I, I can say maybe for all of us, like, I've never been in a show where it truly um, is, uh, you can really feel what the audience is, it, it, it just, it changes yeah. so, it feels so different every night, and the audience is, there is no recipe arrived. It's funny, truly. because, you know, you have uh, one day, and the audience is just roaring with laughter, and then you come <laughs> in the like, next oh, day, crickets. and they're pretty quiet, and, um, <laughs> and we are so quick to be like, oh, they hate us. Yeah. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll come backstage for our quick change and we'll be like, I'm taking it personally today. I'm going to take it personally today. Yeah. They just don't like yeah. it. Or like, we'd be like, do they think they're in Angels of America? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, Wait, tell them it's a comedy. When you do yeah. it every single um, day, you really find the science behind each yeah. line, you know, and you'll start being like, oh, did I do this? this way and so a plus b equals c you know um but it, and which does make it fun but uh, um yeah. with with a comedy getting that immediate feedback or not, or not. Uh, can really fuel yes. us in our show we or, or not our very first scene like we'll come off of it in the lunchroom and we'll be like okay great it's speed through today because not because the audience you know it's not it's quiet or because we're going to give less of a performance but we understand that maybe this audience is one that is ahead of the joke 
So we never want to sit back in it, and we have to keep our energy going forward. So it's become very much like kind of a science. Or totally. Oh, you, this audience can... feels like a lot of parents and their kids. So they're not going to be laughing at the same thing as like a bunch of people in their 30s are laughing at. You, you can know? tell which jokes get bigger laugh how old our audience is. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fun. It's very, I had never done a musical comedy. I had come, even at school I hadn't. That was just not, we never did that when I was at school. And I came from Les Mis, and Les Mis runs like, you press play on that baby and she doesn't stop. And there's not even really time for like, as soon as the audience claps, like somebody else is coming on stage to sing a soliloquy. So there was no relationship between the audience and the cast in a that show like is, that. Yeah. Also, because it's a drama, there's no way to respond to a drama unless you're like sobbing loudly. <laughs> so that was so weird for me to start doing a musical comedy and to learn how to adjust to an audience, to not take it personally if they don't laugh, to not get caught up when they do and be like, I nailed it. <laughs> and um, just because a musical comedy is a living, breathing thing, something like a mega musical like Les Mis is, is there are days where I was like, I wonder if they just came to hear the music. Like, they could have just closed their eyes and enjoyed this just as much based on the response we were getting, but it's because it's not crafted for that. Mm -hmm. um, I hear people talk about this with, you know, concerts, with music. Do you have times where there's, like, way too much industry in the front, meaning people that are kind of jaded by Broadway and just don't... What do you mean in the front? Well, like, in terms of just having people that are not as excited about the show sitting closer to, to mm. you all and kind Remember of... Remember our Actors Fund performance? <laughs> that was, I mean, I think because we had a lot of expectation for that one. Yeah. I mean... I don't, I, I don't I feel think like so. we're ever faced by that. Usually the front row are people who bought Rush tickets who, you know, are excited about it. And if anything, they're uh, singing along, which makes me nervous because then I'm like, oh, I can't. Mess up words. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not that I mean to or want to, but sometimes that happens. Um, so no, for, for the most part, we're dealing with over enthusiasm more than under. Which is fun because also like any kind of celebrity or any kind of, uh, I, I think a lot of people come to our show to have a good time, yeah. and they end up seeing a show that has a really great message too, which thrills them even more. Um, so I think that it is funny though because our show is like backlit because it's all screens that we really very clearly <laughs> see a lot of the audience you know so we I mean when there were industry people you know I think probably opening night was when we saw the most suits in the house you sure. know but like it is very it's very funny how much we see too yeah, yeah. you probably have to keep yourself from fixating on the one who looks the most disengaged or is sleeping oh so we love that <laughs> we, we had oh my god we, we had, had a girl we I have to tell the story. It's hysterical. Oh. We oh. had a woman. It, it was a Sunday matinee. Oh, Sunday matinee. Like, what is... I'm like, so... Here we go. The mic I wear goes through my wig, so it's kind of my hoops. It's caught in the hoops. Um, it's caught in the hoops. Oh, this is awesome. uh, we had a... Okay, don't pull my ear off. Don't slice it. So we had a woman who fell asleep in the front row, and we could all see her. And it, we made it our goal for the Sunday night show to wake her up. <laughs> and she didn't wake up. And she didn't Our, wake up. Oh, you know, the conductor has a screen on him so that people who are sitting backstage can, like, follow the conductor. And he put up a poster. What did he say again? That said, wake, wake up. Me, wake, no, wake me torso. up. Wake me up wake with an arrow up. torso. So truly, I mean, this is not, we are just all, like, Really yelling, <laughs> yelling at this woman. We all had she vocal nodules the next up. day. And it's a loud show. The we were like, she's quiet. probably jet lagged. Let's let her sleep. But then, <laughs> but then, then was like, her you face. She paid so much money for this ticket. Right. <laughs> her face, when the bow started, she was just like, oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> Like, you were and like, she lady. No and she stood up with the audience. I was like, you don't know what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> don't mind me. I saw you the whole show. I don't leave the stage. So obviously she didn't have a friend that was nudging her. She sure did, way. and he fell asleep sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, our, we got we kind of all got a little talking to after that because we we're allowed to have you know we have so we much have fun, fun and our stage managers are so great too. But when it got to a certain point, they're like, we we almost hit a line of danger today, so you guys need to just like not maybe focus all your attention. <laughs> but we got such a kick out of it, but. Um, also, like we've got because it's so backlit. I've never been so aggressive in a show about phones in the audience. We will now. I mean, <coughs> Ashley goes. 
Well, in character, I can just stare them down if they're... St so it's a rule uh, that you're not allowed to film in a show. However, I will say, our say we don't communicate that at the top of show. I don't know if you if you guys remember last time you were at a show, they say, please don't record this. Ours just says turn your, turn your phones off. And I think for a lot of young people who might be used to going to concerts, this might be their first Broadway show, they don't necessarily know that they're not allowed to film. And why aren't you allowed to film? Well, because if you went to YouTube and watched the musical, why would you come watch it in person and then we're out of jobs? And also it's super distracting. Like when we see, we, you know, the curtain comes up, we're in Santa Claus and sure. we see 18 phones. And, and it's reflective. These are, right. And one time we had somebody FaceTiming somebody in. And we were like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> what did that happen? We can oh, see you. you and there was a face. During what number? I think it was like, truly because they wanted to see. I yeah. think it was Halloween. I don't. I but we, know, you have to understand, we've done this show over 300 times. That it's in, it's in like on autopilot. So we can truly be communicating while we're saying lines, right, about what's happening we, down there. We communicate a conversation with our eyes as we're si still saying our lines. Yeah. We like, yeah. So we yeah. we do have some fun in there, and the ensemble gets to have even more fun because they oh. don't have lines to say. I want to be in the ensemble. They get to story tell so in the bad. background. <laughs> I know they'll they'll come off stage and be like, "Today I'm like dating so time. and so." And you're like, oh, I'm so jealous. I want to be able to change my story yeah. every night oh, like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes we'll have people in the back of the house wearing a reflector jacket. Oh my god, those are my favorite. And, yeah. and we can see it all because it, of it our screens. The it's it's like if they shift in their scene, you know, <laughs> if they're going to the bathroom. It's like a ghost. It really is it's a, a really cool relationship that we get to have with the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're we're nearing the end of our time, so I'm going to let each of you sort of finish with something that you want to talk about, or something that I feel like you know I didn't ask, or oh any God. thoughts. <laughs> Player's choice. Um, when are Where are you going to go to eat tonight after? Uh, we're not sure. We're not sure. Are you guys coming? We're not sure. <laughs> we actually haven't even checked into our hotel yet. So we probably will go change head stuff. Later. Yeah, we want to we want to go hang out too with the the. the the seniors of the program who are getting ready to go, you know, to um, New York, uh, and and do, try to do, you know, this yeah. this big thing. So, I um, guess I mean to end, I, 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 we could talk about the show, we could talk about our careers for the whole time, but like we truly did not know what to expect coming in here, and this is a lot of people that is just so lovely to see that people care enough on a sun, on a Monday, whatever day it is, Monday night in the snow, to come out. It just reminds us of like, yes, we love the university, but we love Ann Arbor and we love the community so much. And this has been a really, a, like, I never dreamed of coming back to Michigan because I have not come back to Michigan since I graduated this way. And this has been very special. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, really, really welcoming. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. I want to say one thing about social media uh, and just say that, um, you know, <laughs> You've probably all heard this already, but I, I think g having this platform through through Mean Girls has been eye-opening in that we feel pressure uh, and want to project only the positives of the life we lead and the work that we do. And I want to make sure that's understood um, and, and, and that we don't, we don't take it lightly. Um, the, the followers that we have now, uh, and that it, you know, it's so important to to set a good example and, and be kind. Awesome! Yeah. Yay! Thank I love you. Ann Arbor. I love everyone. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, so that all. was it for this evening. As you know, the ladies are um, sleep deprived and they haven't eaten. <laughs> so um, and they also get to do a quick interview with M Live. So we're doing that upstairs. Yes. Okay. So. Um, Please give a very, very warm welcome. Thank you. This program was recorded on January 28, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.